This is the Living After Faith podcast. Thank you for joining us. I'm Rich Lyons, along with Deanna Joy Lyons. And we have a very special guest today that uh, I share a lot of background with. He is a former Pentecostal preacher. And as you know, I spent about 20 years of my life doing that. So we're going to have an interesting conversation. He is now an atheist scholar. And uh, at my best, I never would have billed myself as a scholar, but it's going to be awesome to uh, learn some things today and hear an exciting story about how someone else has come out of uh, cult-type religion and found the freedom of atheism. So, Deanna, tell us a little bit about our guest today. Our guest today is Dr. Hector Avalos. He's professor of religious studies at Iowa State University, author of several books about religion, This Abled Body, Three Thinking Disabilities in Biblical Studies, The End of Biblical Studies, and uh, Introduction to U.S. Latina and Latino Religious Experience, Healthcare and the Rise of Christianity, and tell me if I say this right, Se Puede Saber Si Dios Existe? Can one know? Uh, yeah, it's pretty good. Okay. Hey, not bad. It's like, can one know if God exists? It, it is, I believe, only in Spanish, so I'll have to study before I can read that one. He is also known for being a critic of intelligent design and uh, co-authored a statement against intelligent design in 2005, which was signed by over 130 faculty members at Iowa State University, and that became a model for other statements at the University of Northern Iowa and the University of Iowa as well. I was even featured in Ben Stein's tragic movie, Expelled, No <laughs> Intelligence Allowed. Thanks so much for joining us today, Dr. Avalos. Oh, thank you very much. This has got to be an interesting story because Pentecost is Christianity, but it's Christianity with a really hard right bent to it. The fact that people can get out at all at times amazes me, but the fact that people can get out and become uh, happy, successful, and uh, I guess committed atheists is even more amazing. So tell us, how did you get from there to here? Well, I was born into a uh, Pentecostal family, a Protestant Pentecostal family in Mexico uh, in 1958. Uh, we were on the leading edge of that Pentecostal wave in northern Mexico. Uh, you know, for the last 500 years or so, um, Mexico, most of Latin America, has been Catholic, at least nominally. And Protestantism really started to make inroads uh, about 60, 70 years ago. And so we were on the leading edge of that Protestantization of, of northern Mexico, specifically. Uh, so having been born into that uh, sort of uh, environment, I was already learning from a very young age uh, uh, to read the Bible uh, fairly well and to preach and uh, in the early 60s, my grandmother was a living uh, housekeeper for people in Scottsdale, Arizona. So she brought me to keep her company. And so I uh, stayed here for a couple of years, went back to Mexico to finish uh, school uh, in the first two years of it, and then came back permanently in 67, even though I went back to Mexico almost every summer. But... I was placed into a Spanish-speaking Pentecostal church in Glendale, Arizona, where I was really raised. And I soon became a child evangelist, faith healer. So by the age of nine, I gave a keynote sermon at the Territorial Convention of the Church of God, which is a denomination to which we belonged. And that territory spanned from Texas to California. So it was hundreds of people that came to the convention. And so there I was at the age of nine, uh, attacking the sexual revolution, uh, mini skirts, hippies, uh, drugs. Quite a feat for a kid who probably didn't know much about mini skirts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I was uh, in high school, a Jehovah's Witness came to my door, and uh, I thought I knew a lot about the Bible, actually. And pretty soon he told me, not only are my teachings all wrong, but uh, my Bible is completely mistranslated. So I, I was helpless when I gave him a passage I thought would help me, and he would um, say that that's not really what the Greek says. And so what that did was to make me realize that there was a difference between knowing and believing something. Uh, if I had been raised in a Jehovah's Witness 
household, I would probably be saying what they say. And so how do I know that they're right or wrong and, and uh, I'm right? And so I said, you know, what I have to do is I can't just depend on what my preacher says. I have to actually learn the primary sources. I have to learn Greek and Hebrew myself to check out who's right or wrong. Uh, well, we were very poor, and I could not afford to go to Hebrew school, which uh, the tuition was quite high in the Phoenix area for me. So what I decided to do is to mow lawn and um, buy myself a Hebrew grammar, a Hebrew dictionary, a Hebrew Bible, and start learning Hebrew and Greek and, and so forth. The more and more I got into trying to defend my position, uh, the more I found out that uh, uh, it wasn't as solid as I had thought. And that led from Jehovah's Witnesses to you know, the, the overall uh, concept of whether the Bible is infallible or errant. And basically by the time I got out of high school, I was well on my way to being an agnostic, and by the first year of college, uh, I was pretty much certain that uh, I didn't think any religion had any evidence for its side, and so I realized I was an atheist, and so the short version of it is that uh, Bible study made an atheist out of me. Funny how that happens. (laughs) Yes. I came through as a a bit different. I had uh, some issues came up in life, and I began to examine what I believed, and uh, it was the character of God, the overall idea that God himself, supposedly all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful, would create a world in which there was so much suffering and then so much eternal suffering in hell as a result. It just no longer made sense that someone who could create would create it the way it is. Yeah, so you um, confronted the issue uh, of evil. Exactly, yeah. I think that's one of the most vulnerable parts of Christianity, I think, that's the ethics of the Bible, where they are most vulnerable in, not just the historicity or scientific claims, but the ethics of the Bible. What do you say to people who say, well, the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God? From the perspective of an atheist Bible scholar, where do you go with that? Well, I would say that even most uh, Christian biblical scholars would not say that anymore. Um, If you were to compare the situation, say, in um, 1900, most scholars biblical scholars, and and mostly Christians, uh, would tell you that almost everything reported in the Bible was uh, historically verifiable. Uh, Abraham existed, uh, Joseph existed, David had a kingdom uh, of the size that uh, the Bible says, uh, Solomon. Uh, You go to today, and most biblical scholars uh, in academia, whether they be Christians or not, would would not say that. Uh, They would say very little of what uh, you find in the first five books of the Bible can be said to be historical. Uh, Hardly anyone uh, in academia believes there was a historical Abraham anymore, or a Joseph, or that Solomon had a kingdom as large as the Bible says. And so what we've seen is a uh, shrinking of the... the amount of material that was deemed historical from just a century ago to say where we are in 2011. So there are just a few things left that that uh, scholars would say are historical or his- historically corroborated. But by and large, even most Christian scholars that I know in academia would not go as far as saying everything is uh, inerrant. Uh, without error in, in any way. Um, they would hold more to a theory where um, human human production of the Bible uh, did cause some lapses in, in historical accuracy uh, or the copying of the manuscripts did so. Um, and that's where we are, I think, in 2011. You mentioned the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. What about the first four books of the New Testament? Where do they stack up now in academia as far as historical accuracy? Well, it's pretty much the same. We, we went from, again, if you just look at the situation in 1900, all the books published in 1900, let's say all of you surveyed all of the professors of, 
of New Testament 1900, and then do the same today, you, you would see a vast difference uh, where almost everybody would say Jesus was a historical character uh, that did most of the things reported in the Gospels. Today, there are a lot of scholars who openly espouse the view that the Gospels are, are fictional writings, that they are constructed as literary fiction to promote uh, the cause of this group called Christians. Uh, others would say that not everything in, in the Gospels uh, is historical, but there's a core of history that he left, but by no means is it the same as what was held in 1900. Uh, the Jesus Seminar, for example, put out an edition of the Gospels in which they color-coded uh, what they thought was more historical and less historical, and what's left as truly uh, the words of Jesus is it's a very small amount compared to uh, uh, what was held to be the case in 1900. So again, we see a shrinkage, an overall shrinkage, in the amount of historicity ascribed to those uh, Gospels. With the strict Christian upbringing, especially Pentecostal upbringing that you mm -hmm. had, how did that affect who you are today? With the indoctrination, uh, the child preacher, as you mentioned, preaching against sins at probably nine years old you didn't even understand. Right. How did that influence who you are now? How did that make you, or, or did it? Well, the main influence it had, it was in career routing. In other words, um, I probably became a biblical scholar because of that background. Uh, uh, that's why I'm not a carpenter or a uh, um, Maytag repairman. Or uh, it, It's the career that I chose that was the main result of that upbringing. Um, as far as other things are concerned, um, I have a better understanding of the mechanisms by which people will report miracles. Um, I was a faith healer. People said they were healed by my prayers. And today that's a, uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't understand. That how can people report healings and miracles in the New Testament if they didn't really happen? Well, the fact is that happened all the time in my church. You know, people were reporting um, healings from cancer, even resurrections. Uh, we had supposed resurrections in our church. And so... Um, to me, those things that other people would say are so extraordinary they can't just be made up actually were a common occurrence in my church, and so that's part of the experience that I bring to studying um, Christianity today. Um, my undergraduate degree was actually in anthropology, and so I, I also have um, a lot of experience in studying humanity as a species and its institutions and its behavior. And I combine that with uh, what I learned from my Pentecostal background and biblical studies uh, to um, better explore how humanity um, has come to depend on, on religion and on text to authorize its behavior. One thing you just mentioned that I find is very similar with myself, there are people out there who will swear up and down that I prayed the prayer that healed them, that I was the cause that caused them to believe in God, or they attribute miracles, essentially, to me. And I find it strange that I can look them in the face and say, you know, I don't believe that at all anymore. And at the time, yes, I did believe that, but now I even understand why it's not true. But you just, unless people are ready to receive it, you just can't convince them that even though you're the one that spoke the words, that it didn't really happen. Right. Yeah, that, that's one of the greatest, uh, most common questions I get. You know, how, how can people say things that aren't true. And the fact is that actually that's the normal situation in, in our world. Uh, most people, if you poll them, uh, actually believe things that are not true. You know, uh, and depending on time or place, uh, you can get nearly 100% of people to believe things we otherwise think are, are completely false. Uh, so um, the fact that untruth permeates the world rather than truth is actually 
one of the biggest puzzles to these people because they think it should be the opposite. You know, uh, people wouldn't say things unless they were true, or why would they say that Jesus resurrected unless it was true? Um, and that is one of the things I try to explain on the basis of my Pentecostal past that actually people would say a lot of things you don't think are true. Uh, it was quite common because of the presuppositions they have, the way they interpret what they see is different. Um, that's what causes people to say things that we otherwise would say are not true. It sure sounds like your education, uh, pretty much the combination of the religious studies and the anthropological studies, are uh, pretty much the perfect way to create an atheist. Some uh, have surveyed, you know, the top ten occupations uh, that make people turn to atheists. Anthropology is one of them. And some even might say biblical studies. You know. There are a lot of biblical scholars out there that are not open atheists, but they're very near it. In fact, I know some. Yeah, it's like the more you know, the less you believe, kind of. Right. Since this podcast is primarily directed towards people who are coming out of Christianity and into atheism, new atheists, and in some cases, people who are just kind of testing the waters, wondering if atheism is really where they want to land, what would you say to them to encourage them and to uh, help understand that atheism is is a good choice. Well, I would say that uh, on, on a moral level, uh, I am much more comfortable uh, with my actions than now thinking back, I would have been under Christianity, you know, uh, because now your morality and your uh, all of your behaviors are based on uh, known causes and known consequences instead of the will of some being uh, who whose mind you'll never be able to read in any verifiable way. So to me, acting in a religious manner is more chaotic than uh, acting as an atheist, behaving as an atheist. Uh, as an atheist, uh, to me, the, the core of my life is, is human relationships. Uh, it is trying to get along with the people around me. Um, so... Relation, human relations are the, the basis of my life as an atheist, not an afterworld or an afterlife or pleasing someone that I don't know is there. So to me, it never made sense to have a relationship with a man that supposedly lived and died 2,000 years ago and at the expense of people that I know are here. You know, uh, So a lot of people... Uh, say I have a relationship with Jesus Christ that makes very little sense to me because you have to have uh, the person must exist to have a relationship with them and so to me I would explain to them that living as an atheist will probably make you more centered on human relationships and on making the world you live in better instead of a world um uh, living for a world you don't know it's there. If people are interested in uh, getting some of your books and finding out more, tell us how they can uh, get that information, get your books, and uh, find out more about you. All of my books are on Amazon.com. And uh, I would say the main ones um, uh, for, for, the, for the audience you, you intend is probably a Fighting Words, The Origins of Religious Violence, which talks about... Uh, my theory of how religion causes violence, the role of religion in violence. And also the end of biblical studies, which focuses more on biblical criticism. Um, they can go to, to a website called Divine Christianity, on which I post often uh, on issues of religion in the Bible. Uh, there are various videos out there of me lecturing on archaeology and, and Bible. And so... Uh, Googling is, is probably the easiest way to find out what's out there. Dr. Hector Avalos, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you. And we are living after faith. Come laugh with me. <laughs>